We are here in the ancient city of St. Augustine, Florida. I have with me Charles Tingley. We're going to be talking about the oldest house in St. Augustine, Florida. Thank you, Charles, for coming along and telling us about this. Tell us about whose house this was. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Townsend. Um, this house is called the Gonzalez Alvarez House uh, after two of the families that lived here the longest. Tomas Gonzalez y Hernandez uh, came here from the Canary Islands uh, in the early 1720s. Uh, and he married a local girl, um, uh, Maria Francesca de Guevara. Now, her family had lived in St. Augustine for about a hundred years up to that time. Mm -hmm. uh, and they get married in 1723. And um, we think this property may have been part of her dowry because her family owned the adjacent properties as well, so she had cousins nearby. Mm -hmm. But many people know this as the oldest house. Mm -hmm. And many people get confused with that label because it is not the oldest house in the United States. It's merely the oldest house in the state of Florida. We're in the courtyard of the house. This was actually part of the house complex. And this is our well? This is our water well, and everyone has one. And that made St. Augustine a very healthy town. Because it's not like all the townspeople had to go to a centralized well that if it became contaminated, everybody would get sick. And we say it was a courtyard because right behind where you are, uh, perpendicular to the surviving house uh, was the kitchen and washroom which uh, disappeared almost a hundred years ago. So we walked into this sort of enclosed porch. What yes, and um, you know in English we tend to borrow architectural terms from the Italian. <laughs> so we call this a loggia. Now in Spanish it would be a galleria. Uh, this indoor-outdoor space. And these are very important in Spanish houses because uh, you have to remember that the interior of houses uh, could be very dark. Uh, you didn't want to be lighting expensive candles to see what you were doing. So an outdoor space in our mild semi-tropical climate is very advantageous. Even in some uh, old Spanish inventories, this space is referred to as the comedor, which literally means dining room. Uh, so you would have your meals al fresco. You can imagine in our long hot summers, um, this, this space would have been very pleasant uh, in comparison to being cooped up inside without the breeze. Uh, so uh, it's a very important space and you find it in all the Spanish colonial houses. Um, this one uh, also had the staircase on it at that end of it at one time. Uh, one of the unique things about many St. Augustine houses is that because of our mild climate, the circulation system, the corridors, uh, galerias uh, and staircases are on the outside of the building. You don't waste expensive interior space uh, for your circulation system. And you see that time and time again. And it's because of our mild climate. You go a little further north, Charleston, and look at the famous Charleston single house plan, and their staircases are on the inside of the building because it's just that much colder in Charleston. In all the colonial homes I have been in, I've never seen this. What have we got here? Oh, we have a brasero in Spanish, or brazier in English, uh, and it's way the, uh, the Spanish would have heated their homes. They did not generally use fireplaces except in very wealthy households, mm -hmm. and the Gonzalez family were not wealthy people. So uh, you would have your uh, kitchen in an auxiliary structure out in the yard, separated from the main house for fire safety purposes, and also in the long hot months you wouldn't heat up your main dwelling by having fires going. But uh, in the winter you would bring in uh, charcoal uh, from your kitchen in this brasero uh, and it would slightly heat the room. Let's speak a little bit about the construction of the house. Mm -hmm. We're standing in one of the two original rooms. So originally it was just a two room house. Now the Gonzalez's uh, eventually had 10 children, six of whom lived to be adults. 
Uh, so eventually there's extra rooms added to the rear. Mm -hmm. We're not exactly sure of the date of those extra rooms. They appear on a map in 1788, so there's some time before that. But the main fabric of this uh, two-room flat-roofed house is made out of coquina stone. Coquina is our locally occurring limestone. It's quarried across the bay on Anastasia Island. And uh, it's easy to quarry. Uh, and so it has a lot of advantages. The quarry is near a creek so that it can be transported easily, but it's very porous. Mm -hmm. So all of the buildings need to be plastered mm -hmm. uh, in order for them to be watertight. This room would have been part of the Gonzalez's uh, house, but we interpret it uh, as uh, our British, one of our British period rooms. Uh, that's the time period between 1763 and 1784. You know, um, during the Seven Years' War, uh, Great Britain captured Havana, Cuba. And in order to get Cuba back uh, in the um, uh, treaty at the end of the war, Spain gave up Florida to Great Britain. Uh, and that's when the Gonzalez's uh, leave uh, Florida and resettle in Cuba. Uh, it's... Um, almost a complete population shift. Yeah. There were probably only 30 people in the entire peninsula of Florida, and that includes Indians, that stayed from the first Spanish period into the British period. That's an it's incredible a, relocation. Yeah, it's, uh, well, the, the population was maybe yeah. around 3,000. Still, but only 30 people left. Yes, it was essentially five families and their slaves. Mm -hmm. And two of those families were Anglos that had been representing New York merchants here, John Gordon and Jesse Fish, and they set themselves up as the real estate agents for the departing Spaniards. Right. So they make a lot of money on sure. that. Now, you can imagine, it's a town full of empty houses. Uh, and this is the way John Bartram uh, describes the, the city. Uh, the, the soldiers were looting houses for firewood mm -hmm. uh, for the British garrison, and very quickly the British decide to convert the former Spanish monastery uh, into an army barracks and build another larger barracks to the south of it. So this part of town becomes very much a military enclave. Well, amongst that military uh, were Joseph Peavitt. Uh, he was a uh, sergeant uh, in the 60th Regiment of Foot and was actually at one time acting paymaster. But he sets up a tavern elsewhere in town in, uh, in, by 1765. He sets up a tavern. Uh, but then he decides in 1775 to uh, purchase this property from Jesse Fish, uh, and Fish sends some money to the Gonzalez family uh, in Cuba uh, for that sale. Not a lot, but some. <laughs> uh, the, um, because what could be more lucrative than running a tavern across the street from an army barracks? I don't think there probably is anything more lucrative than that. <laughs> yes. Uh, and uh, so the crafty old sergeant sets this up as a tavern, and he expands and builds the second floor, which we'll go to in a moment. So we have this room set up as a tavern room. Uh, also with his remodeling of the structure, he adds a British-style fireplace so that you're now no longer heating with a brasero. You're now having a, uh, a British corner fireplace. Uh, and the room over here uh, would have been used as the tap room where the large quantities of liquor and other uh, uh, items would have been stored, dispensed by the barkeep over that half door. And here on the table, we have typical tavern activities, uh, smoking, gambling, and drinking. So let's go on upstairs and have a look at the rooms that the Peavitts added, very much in the British style. This feels completely different than the downstairs. It's dark, it's cool and damp, and this is a completely different room. This is a British Caribbean space. Uh, tea tray ceilings like this are very common throughout the British Caribbean. This is a light and airy uh, space. We have it set up as a parlor, which it may have been used uh, in such a way by the Peavitts from time to time when they were living in this house, but they were making a lot of money off these, because they had this tavern, another tavern. They acquired several uh, plantations or farms uh, 
uh, around the vicinity. So for having been a sergeant in the army, he was doing very well. Uh, so they would have had high style furniture like this. Mm -hmm. Now, Joseph Peavitt dies in 1786. His wife, now a wealthy widow, lasts for about eight months before somebody decides to marry her. Mm. And that somebody is John Hudson, who is a bit of a wastrel, gambler, drunkard, and he went through her money so fast, by 1790 they were broke. And this property is sold at the bankruptcy sale. And the man who purchases it is uh, Geronimo Alvarez. Now Alvarez was from, from Asturias in northern Spain, and he was a baker by trade. But um, he was doing pretty well. He had a bread contract to supply bread to the uh, military. He married Antonia Venz. She only lived a few years after the marriage. They have uh, two children that survived to adulthood. Uh, so he becomes a widower uh, relatively quickly. The Alvarez family uh, continues to own this house uh, after Geronimo's uh, death in the uh, 1740s. And uh, he had given this house to his son Antonio, uh, and Antonio dies in uh, 1869, but he's living uh, by then, at, during the Civil War, he moves out to one of his farms. And why don't we talk about sure. the dining room for just a second. Sure. So this is an added on part? Yes, this section from the wall next to where you're standing, uh, this way, was, was added on. Uh, we know that these rear walls were built probably about 1819 uh, by the Alvarez family, although the lower rooms underneath here appear on a 1788 map. Now, we interpret this space as a dining room, although it probably never was. Mm. This wide doorway was not added until the Victorian era. In the late 19th century, uh, Dr. Carver, who owned the house starting in um, uh, uh, 1886, he uh, built a round tower, which was a bedroom, and this was kind of the hallway going into that bedroom. Mm -hmm. Uh, that tower was uh, removed in 1959 to make the house look more like its 18th century self or early sure. 19th century self. But the um, tableware is based on archaeological evidence. Mm -hmm. uh, so we find a lot of uh, shards in the ground of feather edged pearlware uh, and Canton china. Mm -hmm. uh, Canton china is a good indicator of an affluent family. Uh, because it came from so far away. Uh, the poor people did not have Canton China. It's an amazing house for all the different time periods that come together. We've got, what, 1720 all the way through, and we didn't even cover some of the later periods? Right. Uh, since your emphasis with the Townsends is the 18th century, uh, early 19th century, uh, we didn't even talk about the late 19th century owners uh, and the early 20th century owners. You know, maybe we try too much to uh, explain the long history of this house, but mm -hmm. it is typical of buildings in St. Augustine that have layers and layers and layers of history. Yeah, I'm amazed. Thank you so much, Charles, for giving us a full picture about what's going on with the house like this. It is an amazing story. Thank you so much. Well, it's been my pleasure. Thank you for coming.